This presentation is intended to show how moderate exercise can improve both the physical and mental health of cancer patients. I don't have to tell you about the difficulties of living with cancer, but I can assure you that regular moderate exercise will improve your quality of life. Why I'm making this presentation is that it's a complex subject and I've been living with it for 16 years with a background in the sciences and athletics. And my focus has been on trying to maintain a good quality of life. And therefore, I can say to you with assurance that you should build regular exercise into your life. And this presentation will discuss what the benefits of that are, the demonstrative benefits, how much exercise you should do, what types of exercise, how hard you should exercise. And if you're overweight, that's a complicating factor that we will deal with. And at the end, I have a few personal suggestions from my own experience. This is not a new idea. 1900 years ago, it was already known that a healthy mind was linked to a healthy body. Today, we have much more detailed evidence on the health benefits of moderate to vigorous exercise from a study of over 2,500 published scientific trials. Benefits to both the mind and the body were examined and quantified. On the healthy mind side, they found strong evidence that exercise reduces anxiety and depression, that it improves your sleep, moderate evidence, and probably improves your thinking processes. On the healthy body side, they found strong evidence for the things you'd expect, improved physical fitness and physical function, as well as improved quality of life. They found it decreases cancer-related fatigue and lymphedema. They have moderate evidence that it improves bone health. They also found good evidence for this list of further benefits. Although further studies are needed, I expect that they won't have a lot of difficulty getting volunteers for the second last one. As a specific example of one of their studies, this study from Harvard shows a very important effect of moderate exercise like brisk walking on the mortality of older women. The study did find that for most survivors, low intensity aerobic training was safe, but given all the other conditions often associated with cancer, be careful. If you're in any doubt, ask your physician. There is a generally accepted guideline for the amount of exercise you should do, and it's broken into two categories, which we'll discuss separately later. Strength training, stretching, and balance exercises you should do a couple of days a week, and moderate to vigorous aerobic activity. The total amount should be the equivalent of about five half-hour sessions a week. This is a target, you don't have to start there, but it will give you your optimum health benefits. It is important that you keep up both types of exercise. The top one, strength training, stretching, and balance exercises is essential to reduce injury as you age. The bottom one, aerobic exercise, develops cardiovascular fitness. When you're choosing your exercises though, follow rule one, Pick exercises that you enjoy. Don't just do something because you have to. The fact that strength training, stretching, and balance exercises are essential to reduce injuries is particularly important because you don't lose your health over the years as a smooth downward curve. It happens as a series of steps, illnesses and injuries, each causing loss of fitness, particularly falls for seniors. So to stay healthy, 
do your strength training and stretching and balance exercises regularly. You can do your strength training, stretching and balance exercises at home with minimal equipment whenever you wish. On the other hand, group exercises can provide you with motivation and social contact. They also can provide equipment and demonstrate technique. And every community has a wide range of providers of such groups. Here are a few examples of the sorts of things you can do at home with minimal equipment. I, for example, focus on crunches and planks to strengthen my core because I find it reduces back strain from the walking and jogging that is the cardiovascular part of my exercise. Some very simple equipment, such as resistance bands, barbells, and exercise balls, can be used either at home or in groups. More complex forms of these sorts of exercises can also be done at home with online instruction, but group exercises here provide not only motivation and social contact, but also expert instruction in such things as Pilates, yoga, and Tai Chi. Of course, during the coronavirus epidemic, many social group activities have been suspended. The best way now to get exercise instruction is online. And I have listed here three of many, many free exercise guides that you can find on the internet. Very wide range of exercises available. The second category of exercise, aerobic exercise, increases your heart rate and breathing rate. This cardiovascular exercise provides most of the benefits demonstrated by the study we started looking at. You still have to do your strength, stretching, and balance exercises to stay safe, but you can focus on improving your cardiovascular fitness as your main exercise goal. We'll now look at the difference between moderate and vigorous aerobic exercise. You don't need any fancy gadgets to determine the difference between moderate and vigorous exercise. The Mayo Clinic definition depends on three simple things. How hard you're breathing, how long it takes you to develop a light sweat, and whether or not you can carry on a conversation. This is a list of some simple moderate aerobic exercise, much of which we do in our regular daily lives. You could pause the playback for a moment if you want to look at it in more detail. Of course, during a pandemic, outdoor group aerobic exercises are discouraged, but you can buy devices and services which permit you to have group experience indoors on your own. I've listed three of the more popular types here, which permit you to see on a screen what you're doing, to compare your performance with others, and to participate in group workouts. While you're exercising, it's important to be careful not to overexert yourself. Don't push yourself too hard or too often. If you find yourself short of breath, dizzy or in pain, you're probably pushing your exercise harder than your fitness level allows. Back off a bit and build your intensity gradually. The simplest way to tell how hard you're exercising is from your heart rate. Of course, there's the extreme case where you get dizzy and start losing peripheral vision, and that's nature telling you to stop, back off. Normally, you can count your heart rate by hand, by using a chest strap, by using a smartwatch readout, or if you're on an exercise machine, sometimes you can grasp the handles and get a readout. Once you know your heart rate, you can use this simple rough guideline. Take 220 minus your age, and for an example, we'll say age 70, so that would be 220 minus 70 is 150. You look at the bottom line, that says that your maximum safe heart rate would be 150, that moderate would be 
Moderate exercise would be 75 to 105, and vigorous would be 105 to 128. Another topic that got mentioned earlier on was overweight and obesity. And it's important because it has serious health consequences and exercise helps fight it. The World Health Organization calls it a major risk factor for cardiovascular disease, diabetes, muscular skeletal, some cancers. They use body mass index as their measure, and we'll talk about that later. So how do you tell if you're overweight or obese? Well, the top two measurements on this list are clinical. They're not something you can do yourself, and they're pretty accurate. Some people have a bathroom scale, a digital bathroom scale that will give an approximate percentage fat. But the simple standard ways of telling whether you're overweight or obese involve waist measurements, skin fold calipers, or the body mass index we mentioned before. Clearly, waist measurement is the simplest rough standard. This is an example of a chart you can find online in inches or in centimeters which shows you the healthy, the overweight, and the obese ranges for waist measurements for women and for men. It's very rough. It doesn't allow for bone densities and heights and so on. But if you're in the red zone, you shouldn't take much comfort from that. Another simple rough measurement can be done with skin fold calipers. If you bought the AccuMeasure caliper on the previous slide, it would come with charts like the following here for men and for women, and again, divided into zones for healthy, overweight, and obese. Although here, they're being politically correct and simply calling them average and above average. Finally, we come to the World Health Organization's body mass index, rough measure. It's a simple formula, your weight in kilograms divided by the square of your height in meters. And there's an example worked out here which shows an average looking adult male and it comes out to be a BMI of 27. You wouldn't think the person looked abnormal because that's overweight, but over half of Canadian adults are overweight. So there's room for some work. Obviously, the simplest way to lose weight is to reduce your calorie intake, and especially to avoid unhealthy or empty calories, like those in that rather attractive picture. They make up about almost half of Canadian adult daily calories, so there's lots of room to reduce them. And it's important because the people who eat most of those are 32% more obese than the people who eat the least of them. The other way to lose weight is to burn more calories. If you expend about 3,500 calories with moderate and vigorous exercise, you will lose about a pound of weight. And we will now look at some rough guidelines on the calorie consumption associated with various activities. The simplest way to tell how many calories your exercise is burning is to compare the level while you're exercising with your basal metabolic rate, which is the amount of calorie consumption you have when you're just sitting about. Average is about 60 calories an hour for American women and 75 calories an hour for American men. If you compare tasks with this basal metabolic rate, you get metabolic equivalent tasks. And for light intensity, something like walking at four kilometers per hour, you see that your rate is about almost three times as high as when you're just sitting about. We spoke earlier about moderate and vigorous intensity exercises. And here you can see that moderate ranges from three to six times your resting calorie consumption rate, and vigorous is over six times. You can see here, for example, that rope jumping at a metabolic equivalent task rate of 10 is about 600 calories an hour 
for an average American female and about 750 calories an hour for the average American male. It's important to note where the calories your exercise burns come from. And this chart very clearly shows that when you are exercising moderately, you're burning mostly fat. Whereas when you're exercising vigorously, you're burning mostly carbs. We'll discuss why that is in the next slides. Carbohydrates, otherwise known as glycogen, are your body's go-to source of quick energy. Stored in the muscles, they power their activities directly. Stored in your liver, they provide the blood sugar necessary for your general metabolism. If that blood sugar falls too low, you crash like a runner hitting the wall in a marathon. The stores come up from the carbohydrate and sugar levels in your diet. But you don't want the sugar levels to get too high because that is now known to preferentially benefit the growth of cancer cells. Fat, also called lipid, is a major source of low level energy. It can be metabolized fast enough to power moderate exercise, but it simply can't be burnt fast enough to power vigorous exercise. You can see there's a difference between male and female fat distributions, but one thing that isn't obvious is that these fat deposits are in fact an organ which produces hormones and they are pro-inflammatory. So they can become a chronic support for atherosclerosis and diabetes. Although we showed that moderate exercise is best for burning fat, there are some real benefits to inserting some short intervals of vigorous intensity into your workouts. It will improve your cardiovascular fitness and therefore the levels of hemoglobin, the muscle mitochondria that provide the power, hormone output, and strengthening your bones. Also, as you age, methyl groups accumulate on your DNA, reducing its effectiveness, and vigorous exercise will reduce the rate of that methylation. There's also a protein that benefits your survival of nerve cells called BDNF, which is also increased by vigorous exercise. We've talked about inserting some vigorous exercise into your routine, but it is important to emphasize that you do need moderate days and rest days between them. I think of my training pattern as a sawtooth with teeth of gently nudging the limits by pushing a little faster or a little farther than usual. And the notches are the rest days. And they are important because when you're doing vigorous exercise, you're creating micro tears in your muscles. And basically you do things that need recovery time. Obviously, again, I'll mention that the stretching, balancing and core are essential and that you must stay hydrated during these exercises. My own background is as a runner, and now I'm a jogger, and therefore I have a fair amount of experience, and there's a few general things I think I should say. First off, if you look at the two figures on the right, the one on the left is too upright and is landing on the heel of the front foot, and that is a bad thing the shock of that heel landing passes through the ankle, the knee, and the hip, and damages things. You'll have injury, and you're running inefficiently. The way to avoid that is to increase your cadence, shorten your stride, and put in more strides for any given distance. It's not easy to do. I try for 80 paces, that is, say, left foot falls per minute. And I find that difficult. You have to think about it. It's a technique thing. Most people have fewer strides per minute, and it does require some work 
to change it, but it is worth it. You'll run more efficiently and with less injuries. There's a way to tell whether this is a problem for you, and that is to look at your running shoes. If the heels are worn out more than the rest of the shoe, then that means that you are striking too much on the heel. That doesn't mean you're supposed to try to land on your toes or anything. The proper way to land will come down gently on the heel and roll forward and take off the toe. When you're finished, you'll, you'll take off from the toe. And that just happens naturally as you increase your cadence. You also notice that the figure on the right has a little more angle forward than the very upright one on the left. And that is better for efficiency. And it's something you should try to maintain going uphill, going downhill, going on the flat. Most people, when they're running uphill, tend to lean into the hill forward. And when they're running downhill, they tend to lean back away from the hill. And that disturbs the action of your legs. The efficient action is always at the same angle to the ground. So you want to learn to retain that angle for efficient leg motion and to reduce injury. Now, there is an old saying, that which is measured improves. Anytime you want to get something improved, you got to track it to see what you're doing and how the results are from what you're doing and whether a little change in this or that gives you better results. And for exercise, the logical thing to do is keep a log. And this thing can be very simple, as you see. Just scrawl out what you did, keep a record of it, and then when you see how your weight is moving, when you see how you feel, you can look at the log and see whether you're due for a day of rest. You can look at the log to see if you haven't been doing enough. It's a very useful tool. Obviously, the log could be a little more complicated. This is an example of an extract from my log. And you can see in it that I track my levels of activity fairly carefully. And one thing I do watch is my minimum overnight pulse from a smartwatch. And you would see, for example, that the 1st of January, it was running a little high, so I took a day off. And you can see that on the 5th of January, it was down to a lower level, and so I put in a couple of harder days, which drove it up and so on. So I use that to regulate my training a bit. The same watch that gave me the minimum heart rate overnight provides a number of things. You can see here that it gives a pretty accurate estimate of when you did how much activity, how many steps during the day. You can see that it did show me on this day that my minimum heart rate was about 44, and therefore I was pretty well rested and would probably have a harder day the next day. And you can see good sleep here, and that's important for recovery from your exercises. Exercise shouldn't become something that is an added on task in your life. It should become part of your life, regular life. For example, if you watch television, watch it on a treadmill. In my case, I've rigged little barbells to the ceiling on both sides so that I can pull them down while I'm walking and do upper body exercises as well. Walk, don't drive wherever possible. Extend the range you're willing to walk to get to stores or to do other activities. Use stairs rather than elevators or escalators when you're out in public. I used to work on the 16th floor of a building and I never used the elevator. That's a little extreme, but it gave me good exercise. Side note, having your memory gently failing with age is kind of handy. If you live as I do on a multi-story building and you go down a flight of stairs to get something, when you forget what it was, go back up, then remember, go back down, get it, then go back up. You've just had some exercise. You should also, where you can, build the routine so that it's automatic. For example, every time I put on a pair of socks, I do hamstring stretches. When I'm standing by my desk, 
I do calf muscle stretches, soleus and gastrocnemius, uh, the two kinds, uh, bent leg and straight leg. And before I go for a jog, I tend to do a plank. I mentioned standing at a desk. That's a no-brainer. It's been clearly shown that standing desks are much better for your health than sit, being seated at a computer for a long period, for example. And these standing desks, you can get a module that sits on top of your regular desk. You can get a simple one that goes up and down as you wish, or you can build your own as I did. In my case, the thing is ergonomically designed just for me, so it has the right height of keyboard and of screen. It has an, two drawers, the upper one for papers, uh, in different files and the lower one for office supplies. So it gives me all the features I need to do a good day's work, but it also has me on my feet. Standing straight, that's important. So in summary, I hope I've shown you that exercise is beneficial to cancer patients. I am strongly recommending that you do something you enjoy and do it regularly. You are looking for chances to build it into your routine, like using a standing desk, like walking on errands. You must include regular rest days because your body needs to repair after heavy exercise. That's as important as the exercise. I find keeping a log to track improvements is really helpful in planning ahead and not overdoing it and not underdoing it. There are all kinds of tools and instructions available for the type of exercise, the intensity of exercise, all that sort of thing, but they're not essential. You can get good exercise, just as I've shown you, with really simple things. And also exercising in groups when you're not social distancing for COVID-19 uh, does benefit you. There's a certain social pressure to be there, which is good. And there are people there who can teach you new skills. The benefit of all this for me has been that despite 16 years of cancer, four sets of chemo and a stem cell transplant, and now myelodysplastic syndrome, all of which are a bit of a battle, I'm still able to go out and enjoy the great outdoors. And that is invaluable improvement in quality of life.